On this episode of This Week in Space, we're talking space careers with Audrey Scott and Sarah Alvarado of the Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 56, recorded on April 7th, 2023. Students in Space. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that drastically increases your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Students in Space edition. With us this week are Audrey Scott, the Chair of Students for the Exploration and Development of Space USA, and Sarah Alvarado, their Executive Director in the U.S. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Likewise, now, yeah. Thank did you. Did I get all that correct? Yes, you did. Good, good. Okay, <laughs> that's very important for us around here. And, of course, with us is the insufferable, Tar- <laughs> Alex, my good friend. I... I had to pull one of those I words out of the ether. Yes. A- accurate. Accurate. And not. Yeah. Like- well, like, <laughs> All right. Before we begin, we have a new space joke from loyal listener and longtime friend and acquaintance, Mr. Ken Kramer. Oh, Ken. Everybody ready? Ken, Ken yeah. is awesome. It's not that Ken Kramer. It's another Ken Kramer. It's a oh, no. Different one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Why do astronauts use Linux, Tarek? Um, I don't know. Why do astronauts use Linux, Rob? Because they can't open windows in space. <laughs> See, it's a tech joke and a oh, space joke. Oh, man, look at That's Sarah a and Audrey. They're like, <laughs> okay, if I bite my tongue hard enough, I won't say anything. It's a All right, well, as always, we invite you to dream, to, to join Team Tarek. I'm blaming it on him this week. Instead of the worst space joke, and uh, we'll, we'll let you know whether the the baton falls on crickets or a drum roll like I got today. <laughs> Don't forget to do us a solid. Make sure to like, subscribe, and all that other cool podcast stuff because we love you and we want you to love us. All right, let's go on to headlines. Yes. Do, 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 do. Artemis 2 crew <laughs> was announced. Give us the rundown, Tark. That, that's right. That's right. Well, this is from space.com, and I think any uh, every other publication under the sun uh, Absolutely. jumped on this on, on Monday, but uh, we kicked off this week with the actual first astronaut crew to visit the moon since, uh, since what? Since 1972, since Apollo 17. Who right? will be visiting the moon. Who will be visiting the moon. Yes, yet. They're not there yet. Not there yet. Um, but NASA announced the crew for Artemis 2. That's the first crewed flight of the Orion uh, spacecraft and uh, space launch system. And, uh, and the first to go to the moon. Now they're going to kind of pull... In Apollo 8, they're not going to go into orbit around the moon. They're just going to go and, or not, uh, in Apollo 13, pardon me. Um, they're going to swing around the moon uh, and, and get that free return trajectory. And that's because this is another test flight of the Orion spacecraft. But I kept everyone in suspense enough. Uh, the, the astronauts that are going to fly it are uh, astronaut Reed Wiseman, the, the commander, uh, up until recently, actually, uh, chief astronaut too. And then he stepped down. And then, oddly enough, he's commanding this first uh, crewed Artemis mission. <laughs> Interesting Anybody how that worked. Alan Shepard, yes. <laughs> uh, and, and his pilot, uh, the pilot on the flight will be Victor Glover, uh, a veteran uh, space station astronaut, flew on uh, SpaceX's Dragon 2 uh, to do that. And uh, uh, a mission specialist will be Christina uh, Koch, uh, also a veteran uh, space station. Also, I think she's got a record for the longest flight long NASA continuous continuous flight continuous. that's right because she, yeah. she she spent the year in space for NASA and mm-hmm. uh and then Canada rounds out the crew with Canada's Jeremy Hansen another space station astronaut and Canada's first person ever uh to go to the moon uh and it was a a big uh, a big celebration for the Canadian Space Agency and you know this was a lot of uh negotiations going on in the back room but Canada is building the robotic arm for the gateway uh, space station as well as other support uh, uh, systems uh, for the Artemis program. And so this is uh, how uh, they secure those seats is because they're contributing to the program overall. And uh, that announcement wasn't enough because now they're on a tour. In fact, they, the astronauts were on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert uh, this week. They were on The Today Show. Uh, I missed it. They were down the street from our space.com offices. Uh, but uh, but their, their, their big uh, flood turns out in earnest. And there's a, 
a really interesting story that folks should go look up. I think um, the Washington Post has this as well as the New York Times, but none of these astronauts were actually around to get the call uh, from chief astronaut Joe Acaba that they actually got picked for this moon flight. Uh, uh, Reed Wiseman had to pipe in because he was at a doctor's appointment and he had to train <laughs> virtually. Christina Koch was at the, uh, the neutral buoyancy laboratory doing spacewalk training and uh, almost missed it. She was really, really late. Uh, Vic Glover was late and uh, uh, Jeremy Hansen, uh, it took a while to find them. So it was like this weird <laughs> kind of confluence where they just wanted to give them some good news and it was really difficult to do so. That's this isn't like the Apollo era where the phone on the kitchen wall rang and you went, <laughs> hello? Um, so if if I remember correctly, Hanson's a rookie, right? Isn't he the only rookie on the crew? He is. Oh, I got that wrong then. That's right. <laughs> then, so The chief of news at space.com. Very good. Um, and by the way, uh, and it was very kind of you to give the Apollo 13 analogy, but if I may weigh in as my curmudgeonly self, one of the reasons they're doing a flyby at seven orbit is because of that wimpy upper stage on the S. That's right. Not I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> I know but you can count on me. <laughs> you know, if it's China or the SLS, I'll always be there for you. But um, yeah, it's the most powerful rocket history. It has more ground thrust than the Saturn V, if if I can put it that way. But that upper stage just doesn't have the poop to um, get it into lunar orbit, which is okay. I mean, a flyby is still a great test, but. Um, it's not not quite Apollo 8. All right. Well, uh, before we move on, I have yes. to ask y'all just on the crew piece. So me and a few friends from university, we had our own little ballot running, our fantasy oh. football league for the <laughs> Artemis 2 crew. So I got to ask, did y'all have anything similar? And if you did, how accurate were you? Because I had two of four. I think I did pretty well for myself. Our, oh, our running great. our running bets have not been about that, and what's been at stake <laughs> is Tark's Star Trek chair, which uh, you can see the little logo behind his head. And I won it a number of times, but he refuses to send it because he claims the wheels are falling off, and he doesn't want me to. <laughs> claims. I've fallen off this chair twice today already. <laughs> so. so, no, <laughs> we did, didn't quite. I did not. I, we do I, have I other had bets. Thought, I had thought, Audrey, that Anne McLean would be on the crew. Um, uh, and I was, uh, I was surprised that she was not, but I'm going to keep her on my short list for, uh, for Artemis three, actually. So however, let's, uh, let's Tarek now that, that she's mentioned that thanks for the idea, Audrey, um, let's, let's put up some, some other high stakes bets. So I give you two, uh, I'm just going to give you the topics. I'm not going to lay down my cards yet, but when will Artemis three land on the moon? We might even say which decade, if we're which being de which decade? Frankie. <laughs> and two, will we be seeing a Chinese flag in the distance when we get there? So and I don't uh, mean painted on a rover. I mean held proudly by Taikonaut, who's going. Do, eh, eh. do you wait? Do you want to? Do you want to make the bet now, or we're going to just think about it for later? Uh, let's just think about it because we got to move on. So yeah, <laughs> all right, that's a good bet. I'll take people. you up on it. I'll, I'll I'll do some thinking about it. All right, so I should point out this, yes. I should point out just really quickly. Artemis two launches in November. 2024, maybe, right? Uh, that could slip to 2025. We don't know. And if it does, that's the same year as the Artemis 3 moon landing. Uh, so we'll have to double check and see. So. That's the same year as the schedule for the, the scheduled <laughs> Artemis right. Okay. SpaceX is ready, almost ready, kind of ready, sort of ready, very close to its orbital test flight. Tell us what you know from space.com and Arts Technica. Right. Yeah, so so speaking of giant rockets, we were just talking about SLS being the world's most powerful rocket. Well, not for long. If Elon Musk and SpaceX get their way, uh, they've been building uh, what is now Starship and the Super Heavy Booster since, uh, well, they announced it in 2016, and now here we are. Uh, and they say that they're just about ready for their first ever orbital flight test, and uh, and that will launch out of the Boca Chica test range at Starship, the SpaceX's uh, flight facility there. Um, the rocket is stacked. That happened this week. It's the world's tallest rocket right now. It's got 33 engines on that, on that uh, booster there. This is not going to be like a reusable flight. They're going to drop this starship into the drink off the coast of Hawaii, uh, and they may or may not really try to land uh, the, the super heavy booster. It, it, it's, it's kind of confusing how their plans have changed. We think they're going to launch this month, and that's because Elon Musk has said they're going to launch this month, and SpaceX said that next week, hopefully, they're going to do it like a full-up test dress rehearsal of this uh, methane LOX uh, uh, mega rocket. And if that goes well, then they will go ahead and try to launch the week after. So we're looking at maybe the week of Space Symposium, uh, the 17th, uh, if, if that schedule holds. 
Uh, a lot of has to go right. Not only do they have to pass that test, but they also have to uh, get their launch license from the FCC. There are some concerns that as soon as they get that license, they'll get slapped with an environmental uh, lawsuit by some uh, uh, groups that have been really kind of campaigning for the the environment there around the around the site. Um, and uh, and so that those are open questions as to whether or not those could cause additional delays. SpaceX also hasn't fired all 33 engines sustained for a mm -hmm. first uh, a first um, a flight stage, that first eight minutes or so. Uh, and so a lot has to go right on these next few tests. But this is probably as close as they've ever been uh, for this giant rocket. They've got a lot of customers for it already lined up, people going to the moon. Uh, and they, you know, NASA's watching as well. NASA ha has kind of flagged a, a couple of uh, WB-57 watch planes, according to Ars Technica, uh, to, to, you know, fly and, and observe it. And that's, that could be a signal that they're serious about getting this thing off the ground. Okay. And the license you were talking about, they're waiting for is in fact, from the FAA, correct? It's from the FAA. Yes. Yeah. Now they, the, the flight plan that we have, which says that they're going to drop it into the ocean off the coast of Hawaii, uh, maybe try for a landing offshore, uh, in, in the Gulf of Mexico, that came from an FCC filing back in 2021. So right. that, that, that was confusing. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, fl that flight plan may have changed since then. Okay. Uh, so, Audrey and Sarah, any comments on Starship? I mean, this is your generation's rocket. I had the Saturn V, Tarek had the shuttle, and this this one's for you guys, man. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I will be at Space Symposium, and I know many people are kind of a bit uh, miffed that they will, <laughs> will be there and not being able to to be at the at the launch. Well, the maybe launch, yeah. I mean, you, you may indeed have time to get that at Boca Chica. The problem then is, yeah. of course, finding somewhere to stay other than sleeping on the beach, which I wouldn't. <laughs> no, I uh, am from Texas. I grew up in the Houston area. Would definitely oh. be trying to make my way down there if it were not for the fact that I am in study abroad in London right now. Oh, that's so. a longer drive, yeah. A <laughs> little bit, a little bit. <laughs> well, i tell you what, Audrey, you and I could sit and we'll we'll... We'll zoom each other and watch it on TV. So that's <laughs> what, you, Rod. Yeah. I just said TV. God, what boomer talk. All right. <laughs> Moving on to our last one. Oh, and this is what I get. <laughs> right headlines. NASA thinks Uranus is great. I didn't step in that. <laughs> one. Uh, we got this incredible picture from the, from the James Webb Space Telescope, which has just been doing um, amazing yeoman work and uh, by the way Tarek we got the uh, chief scientist is going to come speak at the International Space Development Conference in May which you're not coming to <laughs> that's great and, oh, no. um, well not great that I'm not going but great but he'll that. but he'll he'll be there so that's thrilling but yeah so so besides deep space besides oldest galaxy ever spotted and all that kind of stuff we're getting this incredible stuff from the solar system and and I mean you know so far we've we've looked at Uranus through uh, the eyes of Voyager 2, which mm -hmm. was spectacular, but it looked like a billiard ball with some clouds. And then we looked, at, at least in terms of close-up stuff, with the uh, Keck Adaptive Telescope. But this is a whole new a whole new level. Yeah, yeah. And we've seen it through the Hubble Space Telescope too, Rod. But uh, what, uh, what they did here, and this is back in February, on February 6th, they pointed uh, a web at... Uh, at Uranus, similar to what they did with Neptune, uh, it has this near infrared camera, near cam, that is a lot more sensitive, much more sensitive than Hubble, uh, than, than Keck can do because it's out there in space and it's the most powerful space telescope humanity has ever built. Uh, and, and the results are amazing. I think they only looked at the planet for like 12 minutes. And from that short campaign, they were able to see 11 of the 13 known rings around around Uranus, uh, uh, four of its brightest moons, Miranda, uh, Puck, you know, a, a few of those, they all shine out brilliantly as like this nice blue hue. And, uh, and this is probably one of the bigger uh, uh, features, they can see the polar cap, this like white kind of, uh, 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 you know, circular uh, patch on top of, of, of Uranus uh, in more detail than they've ever seen it before. Uh, and that's the really exciting thing about what they can do with this to look at these planets because you know it is a, a telescope designed uh, to peer to the farthest uh, depths of space the the earliest 
uh, uh, dawn of these galaxies and stars. But but here they're able to really take a look at something in our own solar system, find some new details. That, you know, we we uh, uh, we haven't been able to to see up until now. Uh, there was talk about a, a mission to uh, Uranus to explore its moons and 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 to Neptune as well. Uh, and uh, and hopefully this will just kind of galvanize you know the the support for that mission as well. And that's all part of the decadal survey discussion that, that goes right. on at NASA all the time, the I, Academy of Sciences. I have that Voyager 2 Uranus poster somewhere in this office, actually. i got to hang it up one of these days. So. Ooh, you should. Wow. So let me just add, um, one of the reasons, of course, that this telescope is so effective is in infrared is because it's outside the atmosphere, so it's not looking through the atmosphere, which murders most infrared uh, signals that we're going to get. And also that, uh, yes, you're looking at the rings flat on because Uranus is tipped over to almost 90 degrees or just slightly over 90 degrees, I guess, from the ecliptic, which is the sort of equator of the solar system. So it's the only planet that, that rotates sideways, if you will, and that allows us to see the rings head on. And each pole gets 42 years of sunlight. So that <laughs> those are slow seasonal changes. It's even less notable than it is noticeable than it is in Southern California. All right. <laughs> Let's, um, let's get ready to talk to our wonderful guest. But before we do, let's take a moment to hear from our friends at Bitwarden. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, at work, or on the go and is trusted by millions. Even our very own Steve Gibson has switched over. And that's worth something. With Bitwarden, all of your data in your vault is end-to-end -end encrypted and not just your passwords. You can protect your data and privacy with Bitwarden by adding security to your passwords with strong randomly generated passwords for each account. And you can go further with the username generator to create unique usernames for each account or even use any of the five integrated email alias services. Bitwarden has new features to announce in their latest February release, including significant updates to the key derivation function encryption, New Bitwarden accounts will use 600,000 KDF iterations for PBK DF2 as recommended by OWASP. Argon 2 ID is also an optional alternative KDF for users seeking specialized protection. A stronger master password has a higher impact on security than KDF iterations, so you should have a long, strong, and unique master password for the best protection. Also, master password security checks. New users who create their accounts on mobile apps, browser extensions, and desktop apps can now check known data breaches for their prospective master password via HIBP. Finally, logging in with a device is now available for additional clients. Login requests can also be initiated from browser extensions, mobile apps, and desktop apps. Listen, the last thing you want when you're flying to the moon or Mars is to discover that your life support system got hacked, right? Those guys, off in the future, are going to need Bitwarden, and so do you, but you need it now. It's a sure way to keep your online life safe and secure. Share private data securely with coworkers across departments or the entire company with fully customizable and adapted plans. Bitwarden's Teams organization option is just $3 per month per user, while their enterprise organization plan is just $5 a month per user. Individuals can always use the basic free account for an unlimited number of passwords, upgrade at any time to a premium account for less than $1 a month, or bring the whole family organization option to give up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. At Twit, we're fans of password managers. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, or at work, and is trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and organizations worldwide. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. And we're back. All right. So, Sarah, Audrey, you guys decide uh, who's going to take the first round here. But I've got to ask because people will want to know what is SEDS and how did it get started and by whom? Because you guys know everything. Ooh. Audrey, you want to talk about what it says? Or? Oh, I mean, yeah, I'll take on what it says. You take on the history because you're a little bit more well-versed than that than I am. So mm -hmm. SETS stands for Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. And we were founded in 1980. And since then, we've existed as this chapter-based organization. 
And meanwhile, SEDS National, what we are able to do is we're able to assist in coordinating chapter activities. We are able to finance uh, what these different chapters at all of these different universities are doing. And we are also able to just kind of act as these student advocates for space exploration and for the furthering of these cosmic endeavors. So I found SEDS, for example, uh, and I became a part of SEDS National through the SEDS University of Chicago chapter at my university. But we have chapters all over the nation. And then there are sister organizations to SEDS all over the world as well. Yeah, so like Audrey said, we started in the 80s during the shuttle program back with our founders, Peter Diamandis, Bob Richards, and Todd Holly. They were going to, I want to say MIT and Stanford, and during that time, they thought, hey, we don't really have an organization that caters to the student experience and their interaction with space. Why don't we create it? And that was how SETS was founded. Then the first conference was held in 1983 in Washington, D.C. And then those founders went on to create the International Space University. Then Peter later on did X Prize. So I think that passion for space has been part of the set CNA from the very beginning. And it's a continuous threat throughout our history of very passionate students that go on to achieve great things in space. So I just have to say, as the boomer in the room, I am so, so unbelievably envious of, of you and your, your cadre, because when I was in college at 1970s <clears throat> at UCLA, <laughs> I was really interested in this stuff. I was in the astronomy department. The big perk you got if you were interested in space was they gave you a key to the telescope on the astronomy building. Ooh, <laughs> oh, that's nice. Um, that's cool. So so I audited some engineering classes and so forth, but it was clearly over my head, so I did not major in that. But I was uh, when I heard about SEDS and I heard about ISU, International Space University, I just, you know, it was decades ago, but I just flushed with joy that it was happening and rage that it didn't happen for me so so uh, congratulations to you both for having worked your way up to these uh, prominent positions of the organization i believe dr malik has a question <laughs> i've told you dr malik is my father rod I, I no <laughs> um you know i i was curious and I, I feel like i just wasn't paying attention as an undergrad at the University of Southern California to, to look for these kinds of things. Uh, so, you know, again, uh, uh, just a, an amazing kind of program. Uh, I was curious uh, in terms of like the membership, how how big of a group is it? And then does is it vary in terms of like the mission for SEDS depending on uh, on the chapters themselves? Like if there's there's one in, in Colorado where they're going to have symposium, you know, uh, uh, ne next week, are they more focused on that industry military aspect of it? Can you give us like a, like an overview on, on if it is more homogenous for that singular goal or uh, more drill down to the, the opportunities for that, that location in, of the country or the world? Yeah, so we have over 85 chapters throughout the nation, uh, a little bit over 10,000 members. And as Audrey said, we're chapter based, which has been one of our greatest strengths. What that means is although we have national projects, the chapter is able to create projects that tailor their strengths. So what our jo Georgetown chapter is doing, it's very different what, from what our University of Chicago chapter is doing or what our University of Southern California chapter is doing, which is actually a really up and coming chapter. I think you should have <laughs> that Oh, man. No, a lot I, of I think, times what you'll oh. also see is uh, chapters that will play to the strengths of their schools. For example, example, apologies, though we do have some chapters that are at incredibly prominent engineering institutions, there's still going to be some chapters where maybe the focus is going to be more on the medical side or more on the scientific side. And that can definitely shape a lot of what those chapters do. And it's incredibly exciting to be able to do these national projects and to bring all of that together and try to address this intersectionality in the space industry that's innate to both the student experience as well as the broader professional working world. So it's a very exciting intersection to be at. The tailored nature of the opportunities, you know, seems really striking uh, for me, Sarah, Audrey, and I'm curious if there's any examples uh, that really stand out. Like when I when when I think of a Georgetown chapter, I think of space policy because you're so close mm -hmm. to DC. But are, is is that kind of the right plan, or, or are there some some uh, uh, examples uh, 
me in the last couple of years that, that really stand out to you? Yeah, I can highlight some of the ones that we are currently promoting through our chapter grants. So to your point, Georgetown is usually space policy <laughs> related. Um, we, have, we are promoting and supporting Columbia's current project on creating a microgravity test kit where they're able to grow crystallized structures in test of their um, astrobiology hypothesis. And this is very new and it's actually in partnership with one of the NASA centers. Another highlight of ours is the Carnegie Mellon chapter, which has been working on a rover for many years. And in the last two years, they won our business pitch competition at our conference. And from there, spun off that rover project into its own business called Element Robotics. And they just uh, signed a contract with the Australian government to get Australia a part in this in space and in the moon. So it's sort of it's sort of those projects that we help promote. We also have national projects that we host and they cater to bringing in diverse skills. So right now we're partnering with SSPI in their Mars Gateway competition. And that includes bringing in students to build a business plan, financial structure, you know, how are, how are astronauts going to live in Mars? What are some of the mechanical drafts and mechanisms necessary for that? So we help the students not just build a rocket, but also provide them projects to bring in students from other departments and show them their space in space. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Audrey, any comment there? No, I think Sarah covered a lot of what we're able to do and just a lot of those really fantastic highlight reel there. Um, I do think that to address Tariq, your point a little bit more on the regional emphasis, again, there is a lot of that, but there is still a plenty of chapters that we have that don't have a incredibly distinct local space economy. So they are able to chart their own path uh, definitely a bit more, and then it'll kind of be a reflection of the interests of the students and of the university itself. But in general, if you have something in, uh, say, California, there's definitely a lot of launch teams that come out of there. There's a lot of space companies that obviously support different launch initiatives. Um, I know that we have plenty of teams that will go and compete in Spaceport America as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the local flavor can certainly affect what a chapter does, but it's very up to them. Spaceport America, they have that annual student rocket contest every year. Is that the, what yes. you're referring to there? Yeah. Yeah. So the, I, I work with the National Space Society. I am the editor of their magazine, and we have worked with you off and on quite a bit. Um, and I've had the pleasure of meeting a number of your members at the International Space Development Conference, which I hope you'll be coming to this year, especially since it's in Dallas. And um, one of the things that has always been remarkable to me and refreshing is, you know, when I grew up during the space race, everybody for the most part, that worked at NASA and in mission control and so forth looked like me. I mean, they might have been thinner. They were definitely younger. The average age was 26, if you can believe that. They had skinny black ties and white shirts with short sleeves and bad juju in terms of fashion. But um, that's changed. And, and so between meeting with some of you at the ISDC, and I did an article years ago, I think it might have been the first one I did for space.com, Tark, <laughs> on uh, the UC San Diego SEDS team that was developed. Oh, that's that, right. Uh, that 3D printed rocket engine, which they, they went on to do some interesting work in um, energy with that. Um, it, it, it's, it's really different. There's a lot of women. There's a lot of people of color. There's, I think there were five nationalities represented just in that rocket engine team I was looking at. So tell us a little bit about how, how diverse the group is and what you've done to support that. You want to kick this off, Audrey? Yeah. Um, so we do have an incredibly exciting current initiative called the Diversity CubeSat competition that I will let Sarah discuss a bit more later on. But ultimately, I think something that really does have to be considered is we are such an incredibly growing diverse field. And it is during this time in college where you will have some people drop off from that. Quite frankly, uh, in my own experiences, there are at times when I will be talking to older engineers who may treat me with a bit more respect than those who may be in my age group. So you're at this pretty critical point where the support of your network during this high stress college experience is incredibly important. 
And that is something that SEDS does offer is the support, these access and opportunities to career advancement in ways that you can be able to step into these rooms that you could have otherwise been barred entry from. Because we have always been as a as a field far more diverse than what is reflected at those highest levels, because people may just be able to just trickle off from this incredibly important pipeline. And so what we are able to do again as an organization is to provide that aspect of project experience, the support and plenty of projects that we have uh, also directly support things like minority serving institutions and historically black colleges and universities as well. So Sarah, I'll turn it over to you to discuss that a bit more. Yeah, one of the other opportunities we offer students is bringing them to professional conferences. Well, to your point, ISDC. Actually, I don't know if you know this story, but one of the students that we brought over last year met somebody from Beyond uh, Earth, the Beyond Earth Institute, approached them, said, hey, here are my skills. I think I have a lot to offer and went on to do a summer internship with them through that interaction. So when we bring those students to conferences, we focus on providing those scholarships for, to students from minority serving institutions, because what we found is that these underrepresented backgrounds go back to their chapters with this newfound knowledge, this network, and it becomes a force multiplier. It, it keeps them engaged with the national organization, and then they bring more students into those opportunities. And to touch on the diversity cube said that Audrey mentioned, we are partnering with other minority centered organizations, not necessarily in space, but definitely in STEM, like NESPI, SWE, SHIP, on a CubeSat project that includes building a CubeSat with members from the organization, which likely would have no experience with some of the technicalities that come with building a CubeSat, but also then bringing the experience of that to the K through 12 community in the institutions where those students are part of. And we're also bringing some of that to ISCC this year through a track that SEDS is creating and, and we're bringing the students that are participating um, in that initiative there. So we are trying to involve ourselves in the different communities, not just as by saying you have to be a SEDS member, but are you interested in STEM and space? Great, we can help you get there. Well, and I'll just add, uh, if you are at ISDC or if some of your teammates are at ISDC this year, do make a point of swinging by the uh, Martine Rothblatt Space Settlement in Our Lifetime competition. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, it's been around a couple of years. So Martine Rothblatt is a, a, a transgender woman who started um, uh, Sirius XM. And then when her daughter was afflicted with a life-threatening disease, she sold her assets in Sirius XM to start United Therapeutics to figure out how to grow new organs to save her daughter and did, which is just, I mean, it's a Ugh. bit of a tearjerker of a story. Every time I hear her tell it, I'm kind of, um, anyway, incredible woman. So she started a um, competition with us uh, on space settlement business plans. and so. Uh, the total of the awards is about $30,000 a year. And the idea is that you submit a plan that supports some part of her vision for space settlement, which is on the website, which we'll put in the show notes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, and it's just been a really inspiring competition. So if you get, get a chance to stop by, because we'd love to have more of your more of your members involved. Of course, I was I was there last year and I, I was in the room when she talked about her journey and I got to see the three different uh, companies finalists. that presented right. the three different finalists. Yeah, they were doing some cool stuff. But isn't she amazing? So, absolutely. I I was like, is she for real? The story yeah. just keeps getting better and better. It, it really uh, yeah. it's one of those things that just keep it's it's like a movie where you're watching where beat after beat, you think, well, that couldn't happen. Well, that couldn't happen. Well, nobody's that yeah. good. But in her case, she really is that sensational. All right, Tarek, sorry, over to you. Yeah, I I, I was going to ask about how, you know, SEDS helps students kind of transition from that education environment to their careers. But it sounds like, uh, Sarah Otter, you you kind of laid out that pipeline through the networking opportunities um, that uh, that exist. Uh, I would be curious about, like, follow-up and, and alumni, you know, helping out too. But there was a question 
that I realized we didn't ask at the start that, that really comes to mind, which is how both of you found space. You've talked about how you found SEDS, you know, in university, but like, where did that interest in space exploration or, or space technology begin for both of you? We have something interesting to talk about later as far as alumni support, uh, which has been incredibly valuable to us. Uh, but I suppose I will get started again, as I mentioned earlier, I grew up in Houston. So we are definitely this incredible space city environment. And looking back on it, um, my first ever job, this is going deep cut here. My first ever <laughs> job was in a commercial for Space Center Houston, which is you know, <laughs> the Johnson Space Center Visitors uh, Complex. That's right. Next and one. yeah, it, it's <laughs> incredible. Uh, that had ended up spawning into a career in, in acting and film and television that lasted a while that when I decided to reorient my priorities and to kind of shift my career from that lens to something that I thought would be more productive in college and in university once I realized that I did want to go to college. I just kept coming back to this idea of space. I kept coming back to this idea of exploration and something that had been so important to both me and my community. And for a long time, I thought, okay, maybe I go to school for aerospace engineering. It's a pretty natural fit with that. And what I ended up doing was going to school for astrophysics because I wanted to be able to engage in sort of this more strongly liberal arts environment. So I'm an astrophysics and anthropology double major currently. Wow. I like to say that I'm deconstructing uh, sort of what it means to be in space and to looking at look at those physical properties, but also deconstructing this human experience as well. Able to look at it definitely a lot more philosophically than I think I would have been able to do had I chosen a different path. I've still wound my way. I've found my way into engineering, partly due to SEDS as well as the Brooke Owens Fellowship. But uh, I really enjoy being at that intersection of space technology and science. And maybe uh, the Brooke Owens Fellowship is something that's remarkable, and Lori Garver is involved with that. She used to be our executive director, and she's been a friend for decades. Maybe you could talk mm -hmm. about that experience a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I honestly can't say I was ever expecting to be awarded the fellowship. I was a class of 2022, so I was last summer. And I just remember being in this state of disbelief every time I move forward in the application process. It's like, okay, okay, this is going to be like it. This is going to be where it stops. And to, it still amazes me just the investment that the Brooke Owens team uh, has had in all of us, in all of our development, both educationally, personally, and professionally. It is something that just absolutely means so much to me. So our activities uh, culminate in a summit in the summer where the team, the Brooke Owens team brings in speakers, uh, gives us these different opportunities. We sort of have our own startup for social change competition that we have as well. And to be able to just be in the room with so many incredible people, some of whom we were able to uh, rope into the space vision for that year as well. And to be able to meet so many other incredibly accomplished women and gender minorities, it's just, it's incredible to know that the people who you are with are going to be the future titans in the industry. So I'm incredibly grateful for the fellowship as well as the Patty Grace Smith fellows who we were able to get to know as well. That's great. That's awesome. So, uh, Sarah, how, how did you find, how did you find space? I, I always liked space since I was very young. I always wanted to either be an astronaut or be involved in some way, but I was born in Colombia in South America back before we had a space agency. I'm not even sure if we technically have one yet. Huh. Um, and uh, when I was young, we moved here, but I still didn't think that that was something possible for me. And I ended up going to college for economics, then finish economics. <laughs> thought in my last semester, I took a class on strategy and thought, like, this is really cool. I learned about revenue management and I approached my professor and told him, like, how do I learn more about this? And he said, industrial engineers do this all the time. And economics and industrial engineering are very similar. I was thinking of getting a graduate degree in economics, but because of the similarities with industrial engineering, I just then went on to do a bachelor's in industrial engineering 
in a shorter time since most of the classes were the same. And there at my institution, the University of Central Florida, I heard about a club called SEDS. I didn't know it was a national thing. I thought it was started by our president. And it was ultimately where I go to talk about space and eat pizza. I didn't do any <laughs> of the projects. It was just because I didn't think why, how could an economist build a rocket that there's no connection there. But I started to find a lot of other people that also like space that were not engineers that were um, English majors. So from there, I got a job in a theme park in Universal as an industrial engineer and started my graduate degree in industrial engineering, attended the virtual conference that we had that year for SEDS and realized that nobody had applied for the treasurer position. At the same time, I had been listening to some of the um, episodes from our own podcast. It's called SEDSCast. And there, one of the speakers said, think about where you want to be in three years and start making those connections now. And I thought, well, I mean, in three years, I would like to be in space, but <laughs> how do I even do that? And then I thought, well, you know, they need a treasurer. I kind of know my way around money. I mean, I, <laughs> I have an economics background. I applied. Nobody else ran. I uh, did a heck of a job while meeting all of these great people in the space industry and learning about all these different stories of how we can all get involved in space. And then the next year I had Audrey's position as chair. Again, I ran unopposed or I got rid of my competition. We'll never know. And now I'm executive director. <laughs> Whoa. We don't, we don't, we don't talk about that part. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think time and time again, it's been for me, it was that idea of I don't see myself there or anybody like me. So it's why would I even bother? And I'm meeting individuals that tell me that's no longer true. And sets is, is definitely that's one of our driving forces of saying, like, yeah, we need everybody. That's all. That's that's cool and very exciting. And I've got a burning question in my mind, which I'll ask as soon as we hear this message from one of our sponsors. So one of the things I think is remarkable about how new space has evolved in the general, but from my understanding, how SEDS has evolved as well is unlike when I was at UCLA, which is better than USC, uh, <laughs> it's not any more critical that you would be a science major or an engineering major. As you, I think, just pointed out, you can come from a variety, possibly any background, be a member of SEDS, join a chapter and get engaged in some way that, that may lead to some kind of career transition into your area of interest. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give some quick highlights. Please. Right now, we just gave a sponsorship to the president from Texas A&M SEDS, Callie Wynn. She's a kinesiology major, and she is working on the human um, uh, body in space, but she's done so much more for girls because, and for the medical field, because that's her background. We also have the president of our Portland state chapters, who was actually a surgery instrument technician. And she got a, um, space grant consortium award from, from Oregon to develop the procedure of surgery in space. So because of those of those interesting backgrounds, we're kind of helping push the limits of what is possible in space and some of the um, cutting edge research. I would say that it also does, again, depend on the position and what sort of intersection with the industry that you want to have. So there is still the weight, and I can speak from personal experience on this one, there is still a weight to having the word engineering in your degree and on that nice piece of paper. But what has been a really interesting attitude shift that I've seen and I've heard from other engineers and other people who have been in the space industry for a while is in situations where maybe it used to be where you could only hire someone who had some degree of a um, engineering education you are now able to do more things like hire a physics major or someone in computer science. And even aside from that, for these more technical and engineering specific roles, there are just so many other fantastic areas of intersection, whether it's 
looking at fundamental physics and research and development now, or as Sarah was uh, discussing, all of these different medical processes and not to mention all of the aspects of communication that have to go into this as well. Things like with space.com, you're able to have just this incredible aspect of storytelling that is so crucial. And that's not something that is exclusive to any one degree. And as the industry grows, it is so exciting to see how much more a variety of backgrounds are welcomed because when you have any terrestrial society, any functioning industry here, there is that innate need for diversity of education. And it's, I think, incredibly legitimizing of the space economy that we're now having a similar phenomenon there. Audrey, you said earlier that you had, I guess, a thought to share or about about the role of alumni in, uh, in a, a, an organization like SEDS. And, and I'm, I'm curious what, what role they do play because, you know, it, it sounds like the, the, the pipeline uh, or the path that your members can follow uh, is, is fairly, fairly wide with, with getting exposed to the people that are in the industry or having, uh, making an industry of their own, like anthropology and astrophysics, which, you know, uh, sounds uh, like a like a really great combination there. Um, what um, what are uh, I, w- I don't want to say perks, but what are what are like the the, the responsibilities that, that you feel alumni have after you know after their experience with sets when they are do you call it peds professional uh, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> instead of student. Whoa. Uh, Um, So we don't have a distinct organization other than SEDS alumni when you Mm -hmm. uh, graduate out of university. However, many members often will find their way into other organizations such as the Space Generation Advisory Council, for example. There are still plenty of ways that you can give back to the SEDS community if you benefited from it and decide that it's something that you want to do to further this next generation that comes after you. So one way is to um, come back and say, speak at Space Vision. So we have this annual conference that we've had for the past couple decades now. And what we uh, are able to do is plenty of people who will come back and speak will have been alumni of SEDS. And they may be there representing their own companies. Their companies may have sponsored them to be there. But a part of the reason why they're so willing to come and speak and why they may be willing to push for this recruiting aspect is because they benefited from this community. Another aspect that uh, many alumni utilize to get engaged is mentoring within some of their chapters once they've graduated. Plenty of times when these chapters do have these grander projects, it's incredibly valuable to have this young professional advice. And speaking of young professionals, we recently did uh, institute a young professionals advisory board for SEDS itself. So we're able to tap into the knowledge bases of those who have recently graduated. And additionally, our general board of advisors, which has those who are more uh, at the mid-career level and beyond, also has many SEDS alumni uh, that are able to contribute both from their current career perspectives as well as what they had as a student. And um, the more so of the one instance of alumni engagement that I was hinting on, I think, Sarah, you probably know what I'm talking about. Oh, take it away. Okay, so um, one other incredible benefit that we've had was a gift from Club for the Future. And so that came Before my time, I think that happened either just as I was beginning college or still finishing up high school, but we received a grant of $1 million to our endowment from Club for the Future, which is incredibly important to us because it has put us in in contact with some of these other incredible nonprofits that are doing all of these amazing things, but also It's uh, incredibly fantastic to know that our own alumni, Jeff Bezos, or alumnus, I should say, I get still confused about that, um, had that investment as well in us and in our mission. So I think, Sarah, if you want to speak a little bit more on that. Yeah, so he was president of this Princeton chapter, and it actually was not the first time he gave a substantial gift to sets. Uh, for that, he gave us some some award money he got, I want to say, in 2017. So that's that's definitely helped us a lot in in increasing the breadth of, of impact that we have to our chapters and to our members. And it's been a huge push for 
the increase in chapter grant funding that we do now twice a year. That's amazing. And I, we should we should point out that Clubs of the Future, that was a, an effort that Jeff Bezos put out with Blue Origin. Is that right? Uh, yes. The NSS got uh, That's uh, right. Yeah. million dollars we, we from that too. We got our million. Well, <laughs> oh, it was, yeah. It's a fascinating story because in my understanding of it, and Tarek, you may have reported on this, I can't remember, was that, you know, part of it was they got that incredible donation for, I think it was, was it, it was a, a, a new shepherd seat, but it wasn't, it wasn't a donation. It was an auction. It was like 20 million it was an auction. Dollars. Yeah. So right. they got all this extra money. It's like, I, I don't know if it was a, a tax burden they were concerned about or what, but it's like, Ooh, we got to do something with this. So 19 groups got a million dollars each. Yeah. And, uh, you know, everybody handled it differently. In the NSS's case, they, I think, did something smart, which is, to, as, as did SEDS, turned around and said, okay, we're going to just basically do flow through and give this money away to other nonprofits. So we've done, I think, five of those now. It's just amazing to see how many groups like SEDS, like NSS, like what you can do when you have the support uh that uh by, by folks that believe in the, in the in the mission there so you know hats off to to, well, to both of you and the group and, the group. and a million dollars is 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 less than a rounding error for, for <laughs> that particular individual um i wanted you to talk uh, maybe sarah you could kick off on this one about the international chapters because you have a lot of them um i think it is it 12 or 17 or something is yeah yeah it's all I over think the world closer to 17 they all function in their unique ways mm. but some of the biggest ones i would say are uk sets sets canada sets india sets italy um sets france which was brought on alongside with sets mexico and they have been able to start working with government or with industry and we have we meet with them about once a quarter to just talk about like what are you guys doing and maybe how, is there any way for you to support for us to support each other? I think one of the highlights to that in recent years was having uh, some of the board of directors from Sets Canada present at our conference last year, and then we did the same thing by sending Audrey and a few of the other board of directors to their conference at the beginning of this year. How was that experience for you, Audrey? Oh, it was fantastic. It was so interesting to see, again, some of those differences of how we run versus how SEDS Canada runs, with SEDS Canada being more of an individual leaning organization versus one that's distinctly more chapter based as we are. And being able to discuss with their speakers, with their space economy um, and their board of directors is just it was a very valuable experience. And one thing that we as SEDS USA are trying to do is to be able to utilize some of these connections to see how we can better serve international students in the US since there are very limited opportunities that you may have within the US based space industry. So I loved being able to go to Montreal and to <laughs> be able to have those discussions, especially because it took me away from Chicago for a little bit. It wasn't any warmer in Montreal. <laughs> I was going to say, were you going north for better weather? <laughs> it, was, it was definitely very cool. Well, you know, as a segue, I did want to ask about those conferences themselves and how valuable they are uh, to not only, uh, I guess, you know, meet with your members, but and, you know, and inspire those those students to become professionals, but also to kind of bring together um, the the industry to introduce them to folks that might be part of that industry in just a few years time. Um, you mentioned Space Vision uh, as well. What's the, the schedule like for these conferences themselves and, and how, how can folks find out when to get involved? Yeah, so it's, well, this year, it's going to be 40 years from that initial conference in Washington. We're also going to be hosting it in Washington, D.C. this year. It's going to be November 9th through the 11th at the American University. And Space Vision is like sets on steroids because we have <laughs> we have educational panels, we have live competitions, social networking events, and a career fair. And it's definitely catered to that student experience. And we ensure that by making it student run. So when we say that SEDS is a student-led nonprofit, it's because um, aside from me, who, who just graduated, uh, and I'm the executive director, our board or yeah, our board of directors is they're all students and, and that's part of the rule. 
So there, it's the students making the decisions for the students, by the students. And um, for many of the attendees, this is their first conference. So we want to make it something that will really impact them and keep coming back as a chapter year after year. Hmm. That's exciting. Um, Mark your calendars, November. November yeah. 2023. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be there. I'd love to have you. Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, we'll we'll talk about travel expenses after off the air. Just kidding, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, Mr. Bezos. So I'd be interested <laughs> to hear from both of you. This is a compound question: uh, What your personal plans are now that you you're both graduated, and also uh, what you see in the future for SEDS that we haven't talked about yet. I'll start by saying I have not graduated personally. Oh, you haven't? So okay. I have not. No, I am a current junior at the University of Chicago. So I still have one more year left before I have to deal with all of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as longer term plans, though, I feel that with the equipment that SEDS has given me, both just being a member of the organization and with the leadership experience that I've gained, I just feel incredibly ready to be able to take on these different challenges within the space industry. So tentatively, my current plan is to do my summer internship, be able to get more of that experience, get drafting applications for grad school. Uh, who knows, maybe I'll be applying both to PhDs in astrophysics as well as masters in engineering. We'll see how it works out. And then just see where it all takes me. I definitely feel as though I can afford to have a slightly less structured output because I do have the tools that I know will help me succeed, both from SEDS and from other opportunities such as the Brooke Owens Fellowship. Yeah, so Audrey is our underachiever, by the way. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> For me, uh, I've graduated in uh, with my background in industrial engineering and finance or well economics, that's where I see myself in, in 10, 20 years is working in finance in space, particularly revenue management, which for those of you that don't know, it's about dynamic pricing and sort of what the airlines do already, which is changing your price ticket based on time, date, where you're going. I think at some point the space industry is going to need to do that for the rocket launches. And I want to be the one setting the price and, and selling the ticket. <laughs> nice. Oh, well, that's definitely somebody we want to be friends with. Tar that's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, y'all can't take her away from me. I had her first, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, if we're thinking 10, 20 years, I definitely would love to be able to have some higher education under my belt. Hopefully have, you know, a round or two of astronaut applications in. But I think I would really love and would enjoy a career at that intersection that I mentioned earlier of engineering and science and potentially be able to employ my anthropology background either through outreach or through ensuring that we have these uh, transnational connections for a future in space. Yeah, and then from the SETS perspective of where SETS is going to is headed, as I mentioned, that passion for space is something that is in our DNA. And now that we are at a great point to become the voice of students in space, we've started diving into influencing the, the planning. So I think right now the U.S. Is, as a whole is very invested in creating that long term vision of securing a strong position within the space domain. And with that is having a strong workforce making sure that they're set up from an institution and from an education standpoint to build it generation to generation. We were part of the uh, previous OSTP um, uh, open calls to talk about what we think is important in that space strategy and in that STEM strategy. And that's something that we're gonna be continuing to do. So voicing our opinion and representing students within the space industry. Well, I want to thank both of you very much for joining us this week. And thanks to our audience for joining us for our chat with Sarah Alvarado and Audrey Scott of SEDS, Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, the group that I'm very jealous that wasn't there when I was in school. <laughs> but I think I've said that three times. So that's enough. Um, where can we keep abreast of your organization and you two as individuals? 
Definitely through our website, sets, SEDS.org, and through our social media. We're pretty active across all platforms. And uh, I, I'd say I'm most active through Twitter and Instagram, but you can find me through through just the sets. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, seconded on the said site as well as our social medias we also have social medias and site upcoming for our upcoming conference if you want to be mm -hmm. engaged on that front as well yeah. um but you can also find ways to contact us and the organization through the site itself but otherwise what sarah and i are also on is linkedin so would absolutely love to be sure that we are all connected on that front and to our audience, if anything that said to said has resonated with you, whether you are a student or someone who is in your career and you want to get connected with any of us to discuss potential opportunities, definitely feel free to hit us up. We would love to hear from you. Fabulous. And Tarek, where will you be avoiding work this week? <laughs> well, you can always find me at space.com and on, uh, on Twitter at Tarek J. Malik. Uh, next week, I will be out on leave at spring break. Uh, for my daughter so we're going to go to california and i might actually meet Ooh. up with our uh our, our our west coast space light editor mike wall there while i'm out there uh so uh but i'll be Wait back. Minute, i thought you were going to say me well well yeah you go hang not. out with mike and not me okay but uh but i will i will look forward uh and and look for for you all and seds at space symposium uh, because uh, I will also be there, obviously working for, for space.com. That will be very exciting. And I do hope that that Starship launch will slip at least a week. <laughs> because the next week is my birthday, and that would be a fun way to celebrate. So. Subtle, very subtle. And and all that, of course, because your publication pays you to go to those things. <laughs> I'm citing any other publication anyway. And, of course, you can always find me at adastromagazine.com, speaking of aforementioned publication, and pilebooks.com where I have uh, my growing list of titles. Oh, oh I, and I meant to mention, before I let everybody go, let me just scroll back up here. Um, if you get a chance, my latest book, JPL Tech Technology Highlights, uh, it's not a sexy title, but it's 30 short stories about uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory's greatest hits in space and science. Amazing. And that can be found... It's, it's a long website, but it, we'll put it in the show notes at scienceandtechnology.jpl.nasa.gov slash research slash technology. <laughs> oh, no. Um, but, but just just look up Technology Highlights 2023 and you'll find it. And uh, I, I co-author that with a couple of technical editors over at Jet Propulsion Lab. But it is by far in a way, the best NASA job I've ever had because the people there <laughs> are just sensational and, and really nice. Rob, Please. is there any way we can get our hands on a signed copy? Um, you know, they, they only print about a thousand of them. Oh. I think they split them between headquarters and Congress, but if I can get a, a couple of spares, I'll definitely let you know because it's a really beautiful publication. I have nothing to do with the layouts, but they, they do great work there because, you know, we all love JPL, right? <laughs> and of course... <laughs> You can always, oh, I already said that. Um, don't forget to drop us a line at twists at twit.tv. That's T-W-I-S at twit.tv. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and ideas and stray notions, and uh, we answer each and every email. And don't forget to check out space.com, the website's in the name, and the National Space Society at nss.org, and seds at seds.org, all places to satisfy your space flight cravings. New episodes of this podcast publish every Friday in your favorite podcatcher. So be sure to subscribe, tell your friends, give us reviews, thumbs up, anything you like. Just make sure it's positive. And uh, you can also head to our website at twit.tv slash twists. And don't forget, you can get all the great programming on the Twit Network ad-free at Club Twit, as well as some extras that are only available there and some shows are only available there. This this show started as a uh, as a beta there for just $7 a month, and that's a heck of a bargain no matter how you slice it. You can also follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and on Facebook and Twit.tv on Instagram. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next week. 
If you love all things Android, well, I've got a show for you to check out. It's called All About Android, and I'll give you three guesses what we talk about. We talk about Android, the latest news, hardware, apps. We answer feedback. It's me, Jason Howell, Ron Richards, Wintwit Dow, and a whole cast of awesome characters talking about the operating system that we love. You can find All About Android at twit.tv slash AAA.